Greetings friends around the world. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel. Did you know that the World Council of Churches has come up with its own plan for peace? Or at least a plan to try to get to it? Back in December of 2014, they had a meeting in Sweden. And I'd like to read a little bit about it. The World Council of Churches says it's launched an ecumenical peace advocacy network. Why? To build a just and sustainable peace engaging churches, ecumenical organizations, and civil society. They said that this consultation is intended to create program synergies and develop collaboration methods, sharing best practices and lessons learned in peace building, conflict prevention, and advocacy for peace, says the World Council of Churches representative to the United Nations in New York. I don't know how much they actually looked at this book, but this is, this is their plan. More than 80 ecumenical advocacy experts, church leaders, as well as civil society and United Nations partners from 37 different countries took part in the event. The event's going to follow up in 2015 in Africa and the Middle East. They're going to have a meeting to try to promote peace, reconciliation, and conflict prevention. Will they succeed? Will they bring peace? Well, the Bible does say some type of a peace deal is going to happen. It's going to involve many nations, and it'll involve many in the Middle East. Is it possible this could be part of it? Certainly it could be, but will this bring true and lasting peace? Well, the Bible would have a different view on that than the World Council of Churches. Now, I'd like to read a little bit about the World Council of Churches from its own website. It says, the World Council of Churches is the broadest and most inclusive among many organized expression of the modern ecumenical movement. A movement, a movement whose goal is Christian unity. So a lot of people think that that's a, a great goal. The, the World Council of Churches brings together churches, denominations, and church fellowships in more than 110 countries and territories throughout the world, representing over 500 million Christians, or what they call Christians, including most of the world's Orthodox churches, scores of Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Reformed churches, as well as many United and Independent churches. As the end of 2013, there were 345 member churches, while the bulk of the World Council of Churches founding churches were European and North American. Today, most member churches are in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, Middle East, and Pacific. Now, even though the Church of Rome is not officially part of the World Council of Churches, it does send its accredited observers to, to the meeting. I listed, or they listed, some of their uh, members. They also have some uh, evangelical groups, some Episcopal groups, uh, Presbyterian, some just called Protestant. I noticed that in addition to Methodists, they have the United Methodist Church, of which uh, Hillary Clinton claims to be a member of. And actually, a group called the Waldensian Church is also a member. Uh, no actual Church of God groups uh, are members of this. Now, one thing about the World Council of Churches is it has uh, similar goals to the Vatican even though the Vatican technically isn't a part of it. Now, the Vatican, or the Church of Rome, has already reached ecumenical understandings or agreements with many groups, such as uh, the Lutherans, uh, Pentecostals. As a matter of fact, uh, Pope Francis spoke before 52,000 uh, Pentecostals uh, earlier in 2014. He also made deals with people like uh, the now late Anglican uh, Tony Palmer, as well as uh, the charismatic... Uh, Ken Copeland, uh, plus there's some things going on with the Eastern Orthodox that we'll get to in a few moments. But one thing I found interesting is that when Pope Francis was recently asked about the end of the world, he basically put forth the view that it would, peace, it would be peaceful, presumably coming about based on an ecumenical and interfaith uh, agenda, which is one that... Uh, one that, he, one that he promotes. But what does the Bible actually teach? If you've got your Bibles, go to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, because there's some things in the book of Revelation that it seems like the World Council of Churches seems to be missing. Now, you would think, since they claim to be the World Council of Churches, that they would be up to speed uh, more on what the Bible has to say, but let's start in Revelation 17, uh, verse 1. One. Then 
one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I'm going to show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the heavens of the earth were made drunk by the wine of her fornication. So we'll just stop right there. Is there some kind of grouping involving world leaders and some type of a female figure? And the Bible frequently uses a woman as a symbol of the church. A faithful woman being a faithful church, an unfaithful woman being an uh, unfaithful church. I'm sure members of the World Council's, Council of Churches have read this, but perhaps they don't seem to have the same understanding of what this is warning about. Let's go down to verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. If you watch how many of the bishops and cardinals, and etc. in the Church of Rome are dressed, you'll see that they have a lot of purple and scarlet, scarlet being basically the color of cardinals, and having gold, etc. Now going to verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So we see that this is not a good woman, called a harlot woman. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled in great amazement. So the Apostle John saw this. Says, what is this? He was kind of confused. Verse 7, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast which carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw was and is not will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains of which the woman sits. Now, if you go through church writings, Church of God writings, and even Church of Rome writings, you will find that most or many writers will say this is an identification of Rome. Now, there will be an argument on uh, which Rome, end time Rome, uh, the Roman Empire uh, prior to Constantine Rome, time of Nero Rome, but there's general agreement that this is a reference to Rome. Now, go down to verse 18, which clinches it for many. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. There's a great city on seven hills that's had relationships with uh, the kings of the earth. And, you know, we all know about the Roman Empire itself. Now, in May of 2014, the United Nations Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, said, quote, The UN and the Holy See, the Vatican, have the same goals and ideas. Now, you think, ah, United Nations, it's a secular organization. It's not being involved in these kind of things. But actually, uh, Ban Ki-moon and others part of the United Nations, or representing the United Nations, have gone to a variety of ecumenical meetings, councils, etc., because they believe bringing some kind of ecumenical interfaith coalition is what's actually going to, to bring in peace. Now the Bible warns that there will be various types of unity, just like I read about Babylon a few moments ago. But true Christian unity does not come about until the return of Jesus Christ and establishment of the kingdom of God. Now you can verify this in your own Bibles if you want to follow along. I'm going to go to the book of uh, Zechariah, Zechariah uh, chapter uh, 2, and I'm going to start in verse 10, and I'm going to be reading from the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a uh, Catholic translation of these scriptures. So starting in verse 10 of Zechariah chapter 2. Look out, look out! Flee from the land of the north, Yahweh declares, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, Yahweh declares. Look out, make your escape, Zion, now living with the daughter of Babylon. There's a warning to leave the daughter of Babylon, uh, Zion being a comment related to, to the true, to church. Now let's go to verse 12. For Yahweh Saboth says this, 
Since the glory commissioned me about the nations who plundered you, whoever touches you, touches the apple of my eye. Now look, I shall wave my hand over them, and they shall be plundered by those whom they have enslaved. Then you shall know that Yahweh Sabaoth has sent me. I'm going to stop right there. Enslavement. Enslavement is going to happen during the time of uh, Babylon the Great, toward the time of the end. The Bible talks about that uh, the bodies and souls of men will be bought and sold during that time. So this is a reference to a time not too far from here. Now let's continue in verse 14. Sing, rejoice, daughter of Zion, for now I am coming to live among you, Yahweh declares. So after this, Jesus is going to return. 15. And on that day, many nations will be converted to Yahweh. Yes, they will become his people and they will live among you. You will know that Yahweh Sabaoth has sent me to you. Yahweh will take possession of Judah, his portion of the Holy Land, and make again Jerusalem his choice. So the time is going to come when we will have unity. But notice this comes after people are to leave Babylon. And Babylon hasn't fully formed, at least Mystery Babylon at the end. Uh, what's going to happen Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17? All those things, some of them have begun, but the rest have not yet happened. The Bible's warning about this type of unity. Now, people will sometimes quote the Apostle Paul from the book of Ephesians. I'm going to read what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And again, I'm going to read this from the New Jerusalem Bible. Paul wrote, until we all reach unity in faith and knowledge of the Son of God and form the perfect man, fully mature with the fullness of Christ himself. Until we all reach the unity of faith. This does not happen until Jesus Christ returns. If you read Revelation 17, 18, and 19, you'll see that this ecumenical movement is going to result in destruction. It's going to end in destruction. Now, people who believe that we're going to have true Christian unity before Jesus Christ returns in error. Actually, when Jesus returns, he's going to destroy the unity of nations that are against him. Yes, people are going to unite against Jesus, and Jesus is going to destroy them. I'd like to read something from Revelation chapter 11. I'm also going to read from the New Jerusalem Bible, again, the Catholic accepted translation, starting verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and voices could be heard shouting from heaven, calling, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The twenty-four elders, enthroned in the presence of God, prostrated themselves and touched the ground with their foreheads, worshiping God with these words, We give thanks to you, almighty Lord God, who is, who was, for assuming your great power in the beginning of your reign. The nations were in uproar, and now the time has come for your retribution and for the dead to be judged, and for your servants, the prophets, for the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, to be rewarded. The time has come to destroy those who are destroying the earth. So Jesus is going to come and destroy those who destroy the earth. And who's that going to be? An essentially unified group of interfaith ecumenical people who are going to fight against him. Really? Yes. Go to uh, Revelation chapter uh, 9. We're going to read verse 6 and then skip down a little bit. Revelation 9, 6. And I heard what seemed to be the voices of a huge crowd, like the sound of the ocean, of the great roar of thunder, answering, Alleluia, the reign of the Lord our God Almighty has begun. Now let's skip down to what happens, starting in verse 19. Now you'd think people would be happy that Jesus Christ is returning. But oh no, verse 19. Then I saw the beast with all the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to fight the rider and his army. So there's going to be a unity to fight against Jesus Christ. Verse 20, But the beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had worked miracles on the beast's behalf by them who had deceived those who had accepted the branding of the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his statue. These two were hurled alive in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. All the rest were killed by the sword by the rider which came out of his mouth. And the birds glutted themselves with the flesh, with their flesh. So Jesus is going to destroy the armies of the world of those who fought against him. Now, although in Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus calls the true peacemakers blessed, the Bible also teaches that many do not know the way of peace. 
including those who claim to be trying to implement peace. In Isaiah 59, verse 8, the Bible says, The way of peace they have not known. There is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. While cooperation is good, the type of cooperation that the World Council of Churches wants, the type of interfaith dialogue that the United Nations wants, the ecumenical interfaith agenda that the Vatican wants, are a crooked path, they're not based on truth, they're not going to lead to real peace. Well, they may lead to a temporary peace, which will come to destruction, but they will not lead to peace. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 7, the Bible teaches, destruction comes. They will seek peace, but there is none. Disaster will come upon disaster, rumor upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. In Romans 3, verses 17 to 18, the Bible says, The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He said, but, but they are churches, and they pretend to believe in God. They say they believe in God. But they don't fear God enough, or believe God enough, to believe His Word and try to implement what God's Word says. Instead, they twist it, change it. That's why they don't know the way of peace. Now, the Bible warns about those who are going to falsely proclaim peace. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 6, starting verse 13. Jeremiah 6, verse 13. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Verse 14. They've also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they weren't ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down. And there's a longer explanation about false declarations of peace that I'd like to go to in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 13, starting in verse 10. You might want to follow along. This is from the New King James Version, the Bible. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And one builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar. Say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar that it will fall. There will be flooding rain, and you, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall tear it down. Surely when the wall is fallen, will it not be said of you, where is the mortar with which you plastered it? So what this scripture is saying, people are going to try to build some kind of peace the wrong way, not the Bible's way, and it will fall apart. Now continue in verse 13 of Ezekiel 13. Therefore, says the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury, there will be flooding rain in my anger, and great hailstones in fury to consume it. So I'll break down the wall you've plastered with untempered mortar, break it down the ground so its foundation will be uncovered, it will fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst of it. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. There are people, church groups, who don't really know God. They use the name God. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? And these are the type of people he's, he's referring to. Verse 15, Thus I will accomplish my wrath on the wall and those who have plastered it with untempered mortar, and I will say to you, The wall is no more, nor those who plastered it. That is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem, who see visions of peace for her, when there is no peace, says the Lord God. Likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own heart. Prophesy against them. So Ezekiel was told, These people are going to say, Peace. You need to stand up and say, This is not the case. And we need to continue in church of God are trying to do that and are doing this. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Many of you are familiar with this in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse uh, 2. The Apostle Paul wrote, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not the darkness of this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be sober and watch. We're supposed to watch and be sober. We're supposed to watch world events and not be deceived or seduced by proclamations of peace by those who don't truly know the way of peace. 
all Christians and non-Christians should be concerned about the type of so-called peace that the World Council of Churches, the Vatican, the United Nations are really trying to push. Now I'm not saying they intentionally want to destroy the entire world, but the type of peace that they're proposing will lead to the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord and destruction coming to the planet. Now, the time will come when they'll have some kind of success. We'll probably, we'll see a peace deal that the Bible talks about referring to a temporary one of Daniel 9.27. But it won't last. Don't be fooled by those who say otherwise. Now, I mentioned before that the Vatican is not officially part of the World Council of Churches, but they send their accredited representatives there. But the Greek Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox Church, is part of the World Council of Churches. And in uh, December of 2014, after having a meeting in Istanbul or Constantinople in November of 2014, uh, Pope Francis from Rome and the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople went out and said that their objective is to have full communion between each other. That is their plan. So, since the uh, Eastern Greek Orthodox are a significant part of the World Council of Churches, and they're going to make a deal with the Vatican, plus the Vatican's made deals with other Protestant and other groups, the World Council of Churches is almost a front organization for the Vatican's objectives. And again, part of what the United Nations is working on. Now, as far as the Greek Orthodox, I guess I'll make a couple of comments. They actually plan to have what they call the Eighth Ecumenical Council in 2016. It's their first ecumenical council in about 1,200 years. Some say it's more, some say it's less. It depends on how you count it. But even their own writers have warned about this. One... Uh, Greek Orthodox saint called Nelios the Mirgusher, who died in 1592, said, During that time, the eighth and last ecumenical synod will take place, which will satisfy the contention of the heretics. Now think about this. If something is satisfying heretics, and the heretic, if the heretics are wrong, this is not the way of peace. This is a crooked way that they're going to try to go. Now, I'm not saying that this Eighth Council they're having in 2016 is the alt end all. Maybe it will set up for more unity uh, with the Church of Rome. But also comment that both uh, Pope Francis and the Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople agreed earlier in 2014 to have what they call the Third Council of Nicaea in the year 2025. Neither may be alive at the time, maybe they will. But they knew when they set this up, maybe they wouldn't be. It would be the 1700th anniversary of a council that was called by the pagan emperor and sun god worshiper uh, Constantine in, three, in uh, 325 AD. And it's something that they want to commemorate because they believe with this type of arrangement, they'll have more ecumenical unity and bring their version of world peace. Well, the Bible does speak about unity of faith. The Bible talks about unity of faith that comes not before the destruction of Mystery Babylon, but after, and after the return of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. Do not be deceived by the objectives of the World Council of Churches. Well, on the surface, it's always, peace is nice. The way they're going about it will not bring true peace. True peace will not come until the return of Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom. That's what this book says. That's what you can rely on. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible's Prophecy Channel.